Welcome to Automation Rehab's Marketing Podcast. Our mission is to empower every person on the planet that is interested in digital, social, or offline marketing to hone their marketing edge, overcome challenges, and help others find their passion in business growth. We discuss the products and services of entrepreneurs and how they're helping more people. We support listeners by providing influencer strategies to expand and sustain their presence while growing their business. Our aim is to be humorous, cool, and entertaining. The bottom line is it's all about getting in front of more people in less time, with less effort, and making a difference. So here's your host, Sean Snow Day. Hello and welcome to Virtual Events on Demand Summit. My name is Sean Snowday and I am the founder and the voice of the Virtual Summits on Demand, or I'm sorry, Virtual Events on Demand. And we also have Latar Dragu as our co-host and David Vance as our keynote speaker for this segment. Welcome, David. Hey, thanks for having me here. Can I just dive right in? Yeah, just dive in. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then just uh, run with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hello, everyone. Uh, Thank you for being here. I'm so excited to be talking about virtual events, which is uh, what I talk about every day. In addition uh, to a few things, I've got a lot of uh, slides to run through, but just on a base level, we're talking about technology, which means uh, a lot of different things. It actually means a lot of things different than what it meant a few years ago. Um, Just to give you a little uh, background on who I am, who we are, uh, why I'm here right now. Um, my name is David. I'm the founder of Expound Media Group. We are a full service production and media strategy firm located in North Carolina, which basically means um, we like make a lot of cool things that people watch, including video content, ad campaigns, and uh, for our purposes here, uh, virtual events, which you're seeing a little bit on screen. This is the little general reel that I just show people to prove that we make videos for people. Um, But talking about virtual events, um, I think it is apt for technology to start these days off, right? Like we've got a ton of people coming in to talk about strategy, where uh, to talk about the whys behind things, the what's, the content, et cetera. Uh, But as the years go on more and more since in particular 2020, which we'll get into was uh, a turning point for this industry, the first questions that we often hear from people is what equipment do I need to buy to uh, make this happen? What do I need to subscribe to? Um, what sort of investment level do I need to make to create an effective virtual event? And the question is a bit of a loaded one, which is obnoxious for people, because I think in general, people who are creators, people who talk to people for a living, people in particular who sell high ticket services and work with people on an ongoing basis, they have a tendency to want to ask a simple question and get a simple answer. You know, write me in an email what I need to buy. I'll throw that money at it. um, And then I will have a virtual event that goes off without a hitch, which, by the way, is something that has still yet to happen. Um, But I think foundationally, before we can talk about what uh, what tech you need to have in place to have an effective virtual event, we really need to go back to the philosophical question of what is a virtual event uh, in general. So just to give the 60 second version of uh, a long story, uh, I have now over the past uh, decade or so uh, directed, uh, depending on how you count them, uh, 23 large scale virtual events with over 200 attendees, as well as been a part of upwards of 50 things that we might call virtual events that look a little different. Where virtual events come from is long ago, meaning in tech terms, um, meaning five years ago, things were split very clearly, pretty much between uh, events, which is something that we might uh, we might think of as traditional events now. Things in large ballrooms, things in arenas, things in uh, stadiums, things in uh, ro- rows with chairs. That's what we meant when we called 
uh, when we referred to events. And there was all of this strategy and all of this uh, construct and all of uh, this content surrounding them. On the other hand, uh, we had these things called live streams, uh, which were very expensive because it became very technical. You needed all of this uh, API. Um, there was limited interaction between them. Generally, it would be somebody coming live uh, and there would be a little uh, chat wall, uh, a little bit of a, a chat room where people could ask questions of the host and then the host could answer the questions live and then sell something. Um, a few years ago, all of that changed when, uh, I don't know if... <laughs> Uh, everybody recalls, but something really big happened in 2020, where all of these people who had millions of dollars in uh, event infrastructure uh, and million dollars, uh, millions of dollars invested in putting these live events on suddenly couldn't uh, safely and effectively make live events. So it's what we call the pivot to virtual. And um, for those of us who were there, I think a lot of the people on this call, it was a very hectic building the plane in the air time where the real question then became, uh, or the the big the, the big hip thing to say is, well, we want to be able to have the same experience uh, as a live event over Zoom. Um, uh, that's what we did. We we adapted all of the things uh, that would be part of a live event. We spent a lot of money on infrastructure. We sort of forced all of this onto Zoom and more platforms uh, that came around and everybody spent thousands of dollars and then everybody made, uh, uh, made a ton of money with it. Since then, uh, an entire industry of people like myself, people who are event planners, people who are videographers, artists, uh, and uh, producers has stemmed up around these virtual events. And what started as just taking one-to-one -one, um, event structure plus live stream uh, live stream capabilities to it has sort of morphed into something else through best practices. And so when we start talking about if you're on this event, it means that you are either uh, thinking about planning a, a virtual event for your people or for people who you want to become your people, or you're already producing things and want to produce them better. So uh, when we're talking about technology, uh, the question has to be answered with a question of what technology you need uh, necessitates the question of what is your intent and what are you trying to do with it? And I want to talk a little bit in terms of uh, restaurants, which is an easier way for um, which is an easy way to make a comparison uh, from things, because when people picture virtual events, um, oftentimes they're picturing something that most uh, virtual events don't really look like anymore. Um, showing this, um, I'm going to show you three sit down restaurants. The first, um, this is something everybody's very familiar with, um, the Cheesecake Factory, which is one of the, uh, largest, uh, restaurant groups in America. It actually, of all sit down restaurants has the most gross income per, uh, per location of any chain in uh, uh, in America per seat. Um, what that means is Cheesecake Factory is built to be uh, extravagant. It takes a ton of money in upkeep, in staff. Um, it is built to be everything for everybody at any given time. So when we're talking about virtual events, this is often what people experience, in particular people who came into this world through virtual events. These are these large events that have to be everything for everybody, um, that they are flashy, they are um, generally from studio and generally spending thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, but if we're thinking about sit-down restaurants, I also want to show a couple other things. Um, this is a local restaurant here in North Carolina, um, very renowned, um, very history. This is, you could say, both of these are a restaurant. You are both serve food, um, both exchange meals for uh, dollars, but the amount of uh, investment, the amount of real estate needed is very different. The intent is very different. Uh, what somebody expects 
coming in is very different. So the easy comparison is a um, a large scale um, giant corporate event versus something that we would normally call a boutique uh, event, something only built by design to serve seven people, to serve something very specific and to serve it well. Neither is unsuccessful. The thing or the third thing uh, to bring up is what people don't think of, which another um, uh, restaurant, uh, this is Satoshi. Um, it is a Michelin star uh, seven seater uh, sushi restaurant uh, in Orlando. They have the number one sommelier in the country. They have the exact same capacity uh, as Rose Grill. Um, they serve the same number of people. Uh, at a time, but the expectation for somebody coming into it is very different. The uh, expectation of investment, the expectation of atmosphere, as well as the expectation of what they will receive for that higher level investment. So while all of them have the same key players, uh, one requires a higher amount of investment, one um, requires a, uh, a, a higher uh, expectation from the attendees as well, what they're going, uh, what they're expected to wear, how they're expected to behave and what sort of time uh, and money investment they're going to put in to have that experience. But I want to, <laughs> before I make the full comparison over to what that looks like in terms of virtual events for coaches, consultants, entrepreneurs, ex you know, the big proper nouns of people is that none of these are necessarily better than the other. So the presupposition that people come into when they're planning virtual events is, well, I want to it to be the best. But depending on what your day looks like, depending on who you are personally, depending on how much you want to spend, any one of these locations could be the optimum use of your time and money for that particular lunch and dinner. The same is the case with virtual events in 2024. That's the year we're in now. Um, I still have yet to sign a check correctly uh, based on that. Virtual events now look different depending on who's putting them on, what the uh, conception is, uh, et cetera. On the far left, you can see um, these are some of the events we direct. Uh, this is sort of the cheesecake factory of things. It costs uh, a ton to set up. Uh, you're wanting to fill as many people into an event as you can. Um, you're delivering uh, reliable content quickly in a way that people can become familiar with. And it's highly glossy. Those are things coming to you from studio. Um, so it's a high initial investment, but you are creating a product and an experience that uh, the a, a vast majority of people are able to get into, enjoy, um, and have a reliable experience as you're going. Uh, but today you don't have to hit everyone. You can have this sort of more intimate uh, event. In the middle is sort of a medium range event, and we'll get into what all of these look like, um, where you can deliver some amazing content, have a smaller, more intimate thing while still maintaining uh, areas of professionalism, uh, maintaining a little bit of high production value, um, and having an even more intimate back and forth. The other thing to remember is that uh, some virtual events are not intending a production level um, or theatrical experience since, uh, in, in particular, in the past several years there is a certain intimacy that people pay for and expect sometimes where they want the experience of being able to talk directly across a computer screen at you so some of the most successful uh virtual event planners on earth are simulating the zoom experience for groups of a few different people so the questions that you have to start asking yourself before you can get into what i need to buy what i need to subscribe to and who i need to hire if anybody are how many people do I want to be at this? Have they already paid for this experience? Or if not, how much am I expecting an investment to be at the end of this? And how do I want people to feel while they're here? Is this going to be a casual experience? Um, is Or do I want this to feel like a hangout? Or do I want to present myself as a TV level authority um, through to people? So we start with the creative and then build the what from there instead of the other way around. So again, if you were 
looking to put on a virtual event, um, though there are a few things that you have to be able to make choices uh, around. And, you know, most of the people on this call, um, some people on here have four-year degrees and then some people have been doing this professionally for 10 to 20 years. But if you are an expert in particular, um, there are a lot of things you don't know and you probably want it simplified. So the basic elements we look for on the production and tech side uh, of producing a virtual events uh, can basically be broken down or broken down into these um, it, into these unique elements. That being uh, camera mics or uh, camera, the way something looks, the way the production quality comes through. Uh, microphones, how you sound, what you need to happen, whether you need to jump from location or another, the fidelity of the audio, uh, whether you're going to repurpose this into short form content that needs uncompressed audio or not. Um, uh, lighting, how you want to even out lighting, whether we are looking for a studio experience, whether it doesn't matter because you are talking to somebody who is uh, an intimate consultation client. Um, number four would be the experience, everything surrounding this. What is the context through which your primary content, the video of you and your guests and the videos you're showing, what is surrounding that in terms of uh, the wrapper there and the platform behind it? And then something that I cheated and had a category for, which is just other of the bells and whistles um, and things like that. So what I want to do is basically take a uh, two hour if then conversation that we would have with a client when we were working on developing uh, and producing their virtual event and give it to you in about 20 minutes. Because the real answer to all of this uh, is that it depends. But in order to be helpful, I'm going to give you a few different levels of each of these things um, that you can consider uh, as you are planning out uh, your virtual event based on budget, based on your wants, needs, uh, and the experience that you're looking to deliver. So starting with camera, there are a few different levels that we want to look at when we're going through things. Um, and I'll come back to this. I just want to prove that I am listing uh, links here. Get in touch with us if you need to copy uh, and paste here. But I've selected some examples for these. One of the things that I want to make sure to uh, highlight is that in the realm of technology, all of this is tribalism rather than there being any absolute winners uh, back through. So while there are different levels of things that um, uh, you can use to produce, uh, live or recorded entertainment. Uh, each of the specific models is just an example of something that you could want. So the first options that you have, uh, the very first one is the built-in camera on your laptop. Um, I like to uh, make sure to highlight that the camera on your cell phone in your pocket, if you have a cell phone here, has a more powerful sensor than the camera that I directed my master's thesis on back when I was uh, submitting things to film festivals. So we have an incredible array of uh, cameras available to us at all times. Um, a little bit of a jump up from a built-in camera is always going to be a disconnected USB camera. Uh, what making the jump from a built-in to a disconnected uh, camera will be is number one, um, it has more room in there for a bit more of a wide angle lens. Uh, a wide angle lens is what people are planning to, uh, or people like wide angle lenses for their close-ups, uh, primarily because it makes their face look thinner. That is the secret reasoning. Uh, it compresses space. It also allows uh, you to have basically a TV sized frame around you. The other thing that a um, uh, that a detachable USB camera is going to be able to give to you is adjustment of angles so that you can find the perfect angle um, to have up th uh, through here. And even just the little bit extra uh, room within the casing of the camera is going to allow it to have a little bit of, better of a sensor so that what we would call your contrast rates 
are uh, a little bit better, meaning that your blacks look blacker and your whites look uh, whiter and everything looks a little bit sharper, which I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, the second thing, or the next level up would be this new level of prosumer vlogging cameras. Um, these are going to be something like the Sony ZV-1F. Um, what we love about these is that somebody had the bright idea to combine a, a, um, a recording camera uh, with the plug and play functionality uh, of a pro camera. So you can plug a USB in, have something that looks nice and professional, or at least more professional than a webcam, um, and uh, add some production value over to it. The other thing... Um, uh, anything beyond this range of things, you start getting into professional cameras and things and then buying glass and blind, buying lenses. If you want to take a look at the difference between um, these things, it's best basically a good, better, best scenario. I would say your biggest jump is going to be going up through professional cameras and the necessary uh, people to use them. Um, so you're probably going to want to remain somewhere in this middle distance. The other thing to remember with these virtual events is that by the nature of uh, live broadcasting on these things, because you have video going back and forth, the image quality is always going to suffer regardless. So even if you have the most pristine footage, it can be frustrating for people when they invest a lot of money when suddenly everything looks a little muddier. Uh, in general, and all we can do is hope that uh, fiber internet catches up with us and lets us send more ones and zeros as we're going. Um, yeah, the, regardless, framing your shot correctly, I'm not going to get into cinematographic technique too much, but this is my one PSA for people uh, in this world is to stop putting so much headroom above you. People have gotten better at it in general, but um, do not put the top of your uh, head in the middle of the screen. Probably better than investing in any um, high quality camera is just learning to frame things in a way that is beneficial. Um, in terms of lighting, which is something people think about less often than the camera, but has a more profound impact regardless on how somebody's footage looks than the camera itself. You've got a few different options. Um, the first and the most accessible is going to be natural light, which people don't like to think about because uh, it seems too easy. But uh, I like to tell people from my years in production that uh, a, a light with the quality and uh, forceful forcefulness. Um, the quality and brightness of natural light uh, is going to cost between ten and twenty thousand dollars on a movie set. These are these giant ten uh, k par uh, lights that people are paying fifteen grand just to make it look like light coming in through your window. So, uh, even if you're just framing with a window, you're getting plenty of light. Uh, now, this is not uh, easily accessible or easily doable for some people based on room setup, based on, you know, maybe you're doing this event all day and can't um, uh, can't uh, just count on morning daylight all day. In that case, the thing that everybody knows now is the basic ring light. These are available on Amazon for $30 to $50. Um, a couple of years ago, everybody suddenly knew they were supposed to get a ring light and nobody particularly knew why they just bought them. The reason that ring lights became so popular is that a their original uh, technique was to put a camera in the middle of it. So while you're getting even light coming uh, from it, you're staring directly into a lens. Uh, people don't actually do that. Um, too too much anymore unless they're recording on their phone the other reason for the ring light is it's built for the human face which is generally what you're wanting to light up the uh ring of the light hits you hardest here and then does a subtle um distribution towards the back of the face so it's easy to plug and play the thing that we're using and sending clients most of the time now uh, are these little things called loom cubes these are a middle ground where they're um, easily adjustable LED panels. They fit in your pocket and you can set up three or four um, anytime you want to. The thing that these do really well is they come with natural diffusion, meaning that you get that nice glamorous soft light um, hitting you that just by throwing them on, 
um, you're getting a professional look. Anything past this, and you start getting into semi-pro and then pro lighting setups. Um, and if you want to invest in this, particularly if you're building a home studio or setting up for three days, it can be worth it to get a three-piece kit and play around with it. Um, LED lights are a lot better than they were even um, five, ten years ago um, and are able to adjust the color temperature uh, associated with it. Get in touch with us if you want specific ones. I've provided some links um, here as well. But just be warned, lighting is a lot harder uh, professional lighting is a lot harder than people tend to think it is. Um, if you want the basics of it, just make sure more light's hitting you than is hitting the things behind you. Um, yeah, so that's basically it for lighting. If we're thinking about sound options, um, I, I, I was just talking yesterday and giving a talk, and even this far into us doing virtual events, there still isn't an ideal, like this is the mic you need to be buying. The first option for you is always going to be your built-in mic, but we're finally getting to a point now where Zoom audio bit rate is exceeding what your onboard mic is probably going to want to do. Uh, the, the mic that everybody's familiar with now is the Blue Yeti. Um, this is easy because it comes out naturally through USB comes in through things. In theory, you're supposed to be able to plug one of these in and go in practice. I get a lot of um, clients trying to get me to moonlight as tech support on their Blue Yeti mics. So uh, buyer beware is for some people it works great. Um, it's a easy middle ground. Um, the mics we use when we're recording podcasts, we're doing live stream are the Shure MV7s. These are great podcasting mics because they put out both USB and XLR, um, which as you grow, as you create more content, and particularly if you want to start diving into podcasting interviews as the output, you want your mic to have um, coming through. I, I say all of this to say you've got plenty of options and you can spend as much money uh, as you want to when you're developing uh, your sound setup. What I will say um, as you are doing this is before you start spending thousands of dollars in microphone, take a look at your sound environment uh, at home. Um, it is much easier to pay attention, record something, and then realize that you can turn your air conditioning off for an hour than it is to set up an entire new microphone set, um, system. The biggest audio problems that anybody has is invasive noise uh, because a microphone doesn't have the discernment of our of our ears. So pay attention to your air conditioning, pay attention to your appliances, uh, and pay attention to the amount of traffic and dogs nearby, and you will make an audio engineer's day and year um, coming through uh, that uh, weird way to end a sentence, but uh, you get where I'm, I'm coming from here. Um, as we're thinking about vibes uh, for things, there was a moment uh, when we were doing tech setups and we were doing production uh, setups where everybody suddenly become or became obsessed with does my Zoom background uh, look great? And a lot of coachy types uh, made a lot of money or at least a lot of content uh, critiquing people's Zoom backgrounds. Fortunately now, or unfortunately, depending on who you are, um, people care less about it now. Uh, everybody has gotten used to looking at people in these little screens. Um, so it, it is not the tantamount that everybody wants to, but if you're producing something, you want it to look as good as it can, and you want it to be uh, not distracting more than anything. I made up these things for uh, for key uh, key elements to think about, regardless of what level of event uh, you're putting on. Number one is distance. The main thing that you don't want is to be directly against a wall. This will flatten your image considerably um, and uh, make it look a little bit cheaper because the cameras you're using probably aren't going to be able to differentiate yourself super well from the wall. Um, number two would be distraction or in this case, lack thereof. You're wanting, regardless of if you're using an onboard webcam, um, I, I'm not saying it can't be busy. I've actually provided a 
um, an image of one of the backgrounds we were producing uh, in a Fenton. And there's plenty of stuff in the background, but there's nothing pulling focus away from uh, the subject uh, herself. That's what we want to make sure. Um, dynamic, uh, you probably don't want to be doing what I'm doing right now, honestly. You want something in the background that differentiates you and that provides uh, some little jolt of color, uh, some little jolt of shape that provides an interesting background. And then uh, dim, because I needed a third or a fourth D word. Uh, the main thing, as said before, is to not let your background be lighter than your face or lit more poorly than your face, because especially if you're using an onboard webcam um, or something that is automatically adjusting its light levels, it's going to adjust and balance things based on what the brightest thing in the frame is. So you want that to be... Um, uh, I want that to be you. And lastly, just talking about uh, context. Um, I told you I'd go fast. Um, talking about context or uh, platform, uh, et cetera, this is a very confusing marketplace uh, right now. And we could spend uh, we we could spend hours and uh, days going through the benefits and features of all of these. But really, thinking about it, we've really got a single uh, uh, a, a single conflict right now, which is should I use Zoom for my summit live stream virtual event or should I use one of these boutique platforms? As we all know, Zoom was never really originally designed for these large scale virtual uh, events, but it has become the go to the Pros of going along with Zoom are, uh, number one is familiarity, and that's familiarity for the majority of uh, event planners. That meaning that uh, if you are somebody who is not using an event planning company, if you're trying to put together something a uh, low cost, you probably already know most of the ins and outs of how the platform works. Um, because number two, it's relatively easy to use. This is not a specialist to software. Everything within the zoom platform is positioned where it is to keep things uh easy simple um and uh on on demand at your fingertips it's also familiar and relatively easy to use for attendees and as anybody who has planned an event knows it is impossible to underestimate the technical know-how of a generalized audience, meaning that even if you think everything is really straightforward, even if you send really specific um, instructions on how your boutique or uh, customized platform works, people will have trouble with it. So if you're planning in particular to give a high ticket offer, um, or if you're trying to move people into sales calls, getting them to that point where you're going to make that offer is tantamount above all else. Um, and it, it just kind of works, which is nice. Um, you, you know, the biggest thing that you don't want in a lot of times, especially if your event in particular is all based on a main stage, is a lot of distractions for people to go through. There are also other platforms that uh, we can get into uh, individual, but these are the bespoke platforms that are built around the virtual event structure. Uh, number one, you're going to get on most of these a higher image and audio fidelity. Um, that means that without having to upgrade and getting the uh, industry versions of these, you're going to be able to broadcast in HD. Um, but even more importantly than the lines of resolution without getting too much into the nerd stuff of this is your uh, native bit rate. Um, bit rate, if you want a very boring thing to talk about at parties, is basically just uh, dictates how many different versions of gray there can be. Um, the, the simple summation is the higher your bit rate, the more sexy your image is going to be. Um, so that's obviously ideal. Um, you can also customize all of these things. Um, these are 
uh, can be ex, uh, bespoke experience. You can rebrand things a little more easily than you can on Zoom. And more importantly for some people is the theatricality or experiential elements of this. Um, in particular, larger organizations are wanting to sell virtual real estate on the show floors. They're looking to replicate experiences and set up uh, networking uh, areas and make things <laughs> Uh, this was something that all of us were um, started to make fun of after a couple of years. But, you know, providing the true event experience can happen through some of these other platforms. Um, now, these are going to come at a cost in terms of your time and tech investment, as well as your uh, money investment. So you have to weigh all of these against uh, one another. And it kind of goes back to what... Uh, we were talking about right at the beginning of this, of any of these technical decisions that you're making uh, aren't right or wrong. They always come back down to um, what do I want to accomplish? What impact um, or emotion do I want to stir in people? Who's going to be there? And what do I want them to do? Those are the foundational questions that a bunch of other people are going to uh, be more qualified than I am to talk about over uh, these next sessions and these next days. But regardless, every event is different. And as you are uh, choosing things, it takes a, uh, a, a customized output to translate what you want people to experience into uh, the ones and zeros and into the various cables, microphones, and cameras uh, that you had. Um, I did want to say just for um, people here, we've got a free resource. Um, I just put the page back live again. This is normally a uh, $96 uh, ebook, um, mostly because I find this the easiest way to uh, get in touch with us. So if you go, you can claim uh, a free resource. It's actually a video starter guide, which has some things re uh, relevant to uh, relevant to your virtual events in terms of video production, but also everything you need in there in order to create a, a video campaign to actually get people to buy tickets, and then actually show up, which, as we all know, is harder than people think. Also, if uh, you download this within the next, uh, I'm making up an hour's um, time limiter here, but if you register um, and download this uh, cool thing from us, uh, our producer will get in touch with you and we will schedule a free 30 minute um uh, assessment of whatever event you have in the pipeline right now where instead of going through these in generalities we can produce the exact list of things that you will need to make your event the experience that you want it to be um i uh, appreciate being here i'm always uh happy um to come and talk about virtual events because quite honestly in the same way there have become uh, a thousand percent more virtual events every single month the, than there were a few years. There's also become about 800 percent more poor ones. And for people who are um, doing cool stuff, building cool things, um, helping people uh, accomplish things, uh, we need more higher quality uh, productions. So anything I can do to help people out uh, with that would love to. So head to Expound Resource if you want to get in touch with me and um, I'm excited for you to see all the rest of the speakers this week. All right. Thanks so much, David. That was great. Thanks. Did I, did I miss something? That that feels like a, it felt pretty comprehensive. Well, I, I, I feel like I know so much. And then like technically, I mean, you kept it really simple, but also, you know, you're talking about mics and cameras. I always tell people the least amount of investment and you're showing them, you know, you can still be 1080p and provide value. Uh, one of my questions, though, is when it comes to uh, events having um, a hybrid, um, what challenges would people have when doing where it's live, but they're also streaming? It's funny. I was just talking to our um studio partners about this and if you'll remember you know we've all been in uh, this space for a while everybody got very excited about hybrid a couple of years ago in that like we're going to a hybrid model 
uh, for this. And then it it you've heard it a little bit die down um, now because number one, it it's it, it's hard to make as good of an experience when you're hybridizing things because you're either creating an amazing live experience and then all of your remote viewership feels like they're kind of voyeuring in at something that they're not really a part of or you're playing to your larger virtual crowd and then you have all of these people who paid thousands of dollars to fly out get hotels be in a room sort of seated off to the side um so i think the main thing is to be really comprehensive in um in and creative in how you are presenting that i think you then have to be creative about um making sure that the at-home viewer feels like they are a part of the live experience the the other thing is everything doubles in cost there right um you can do it in a smaller um in a smaller space there but if you're trying to make sure that zoom you have to also have the infrastructure to have people ask questions remotely in addition to a yeah. full on-site av team so there's a lot of complications that go along with it i think um there is a there's starting to be a giant difference in how people are conceptualizing them so we're really excited for um for that in the future and also looking ahead into the next 10 years some of this augmented reality stuff that um people are only really starting to play with and as um you know apple vision pro and some of this ar uh tech evolves we're going to start seeing the uh immensity of the uh of the at home experiences that people are going to be able to put on so it's it's, a, it's going to be very exciting over the next decade yeah yeah it, definitely well that was great and um we look forward to hearing more about you now if you want to get connected directly with david the first thing you want to do is go to expound resource dot yeah. com right expound resource yes yeah if there's a it's a simple uh then just throw your email in um we've got somebody standing by over the next uh over the next day or two we'll get in touch with you directly um i'll tell you looking behind the curtain it is so much work for our team to take yeah. away our uh consultation thing from beyond the paywall but i want to make right. sure anybody on here can get on our calendar and um get a free consultation for it so if you uh up then we'll reach out to you personally yeah and you'll also get the ebook of 98 yeah um it, it, it's a great resource um i, I wrote it myself it's it uh, if you like what we were talking about here, this kind of takes it on to the next step of now that I've been selecting uh, content, What, how do I make video content that is actually uh, yeah. great? How do I make marketing materials, um, uh, live virtual events, uh, all of that good stuff, all of that experiences, those experiences. All right, all right David. Well, thanks so much. We're going to come up to our next segment. And, thanks. Uh, and yeah. thanks for showing up.